Returning now from segment one of part three in the Silvergate Bank deep dive series. This is segment two of two, which wraps up part three. After this, only part four, what's next remains. In the last segment, I explained tier one regulatory capital ratios, which banks need to maintain uh, to stay in business as a bank or be taken over by regulators. Banks hate that. So let's look at what would have happened if Silvergate didn't create ghost assets and just played the quarter straight from an accounting perspective. Well, first of all, they wouldn't have taken a valuation allowance against their deferred tax assets. At the point they took a 100% valuation allowance, they were still a bank and they still had Coinbase and Kraken as clients on their Silvergate Exchange Network, the SEN. If things would have stabilized, an FHL bank wouldn't have called in their $4.3 billion loan early. They had every expectation of a return to the kind of profitability established in earlier years and quarters. So why take a 100% valuation allowance against $342 million in deferred tax assets? Well, tier one capital requirement ratios, that's why. So if we take out the valuation allowance and take out the 192, I'm sorry, 196.2 million write-off for the DM stablecoin as an intangible, which was an asset every other quarter, and we remove the 134.5 million loss in security sales attributable to the following quarter they went ahead and took in advance, we lessen the reported loss by 672.7 million. Instead of a 1 billion loss for the quarter, it's 327 million. That's the actual loss. Sounds way better, doesn't it? And they would have loved to report that true number, I'm sure, but they would have been out of compliance on tier one regulatory ratios and would have been taken over by regulators. This is possibly why, and I would say the likely reason why, that FHL Bank decided not to roll forward their 4.3 billion loan and call it due, prompting their March 8th SEC filing and press release that due to this action, they had to sell more securities at a loss and were liquidating the bank to preserve shareholder value. Let's look at the series of events between that earnings call on January 17th up until today, April 16th. So we have 117 earnings call, and then somewhere in between 117 and 38, FHL Bank, Federal Home Loan Bank, called in their $4.3 billion loan, and securities were sold to cover that loan. Uh, on in early uh, March, Marathon Digital repaid their 50 million credit line. Um, and on 3-8, uh, Silvergate announced liquidation of the bank. On 3-31, MicroStrategy repaid back its $205 million line of credit uh, for $166 million, incurring a $39 million loss on that loan um, to Silvergate. So if we look at the FHL bank loan, that's 4.3 billion they paid back, minus the 1.5 billion in securities they'd already sold um, and taken the loss uh, for on the previous quarter at 134.5. And, uh, and uh, so that's 1.5 billion off of the 4.3 billion that we know that they had to pay, at least 2.8 billion in securities they still needed to sell. 2.8 billion generates 252 million further losses. If we take the 1.5 billion loan and the 134.5 million in losses that they had uh, taken in advance, we come up with 9% is what they're, uh, it's costing them to sell these securities. And if we apply that to the 2.8 billion remaining, we generate 252 million further loss. Um, and then the micro strategy loan repayment which was uh, 166 million against 205 million. That's another 39 million loss. They had a loss on derivatives of 8.4 million that were hedges um, for further uh, uh, interest rate uh, uh, losses. And so that takes the 603,221,000 shareholder equity reported in quarter four, that takes that down to 303,821,000. Preferred shares are paid out um, at $200 million with a par of $1,000 per preferred share. Um, and so uh, if, if we assume they're liquidating uh, and paying out preferreds, that would take place knocking down common uh, to 103821000 or $2.22 left per share for common. Um, that's if they liquidate, don't stay around, wait to get bought out for their deferred taxes, et cetera, et cetera. 
That's just the lowest. That, that's that's not even taking into account the ghost assets. If we plug back in the ghost assets, which are in fact real assets, we plug in Diem. Um, that's the uh, stable coin they bought from Facebook Meta for two hundred million dollars about a year ago, uh, and it's been on the assets every quarter until this one when they decided to wipe it off so that they could uh, free up tier one uh, capital ratios. So plug that back in, 196.2 million is the write-off they took on it. That brings us back up to 300 million, 21,000, or 643 per share um, in book value. Plug in the deferred tax assets, which are real assets, that's 342 million, brings us to 642 million, 21,000, or $13.71 per tangible diluted share. Plug in the SEN network, which has had offers in the 500 million range reportedly by multiple sources. And that brings the total shareholder equity to 1.14 billion after paying off preferreds or $24.44 a share. Since nobody other than Silvergate has the info necessary to make a more accurate valuation, there could be unforeseen puts and takes from either side. There could be more liquidation expenses, but not on the level of beforehand since all their major loans are closed now and the securities are sold. But allowing for another 200 million to the downside still puts a tangible book value at about $20 per share. No matter what you put in, if you value the assets at what they're worth, the hypothesis is confirmed that Silvergate is worth approximately 10 to 15 times the current share price for liquidation purposes and for acquisition purposes. This concludes the second and final segment of part three in the Silvergate Bank Deep Dive series. The final part, part four, what's next, is on deck.